Hi, welcome to this week's lecture. I'm going to be talking briefly about textbooks and the role of textbooks in the history classroom. I'm going to start um, in the first section by looking at a little bit of the research on history textbooks and on what some of the academics who've considered textbooks have to say on the matter. And in the second part of the lecture to say something a bit more practically focused on how teachers can use textbooks. And in the third part, I just want to share um, some findings and thoughts from a case study looking at Malaysian history textbooks and use that to introduce a task for the week. So just by way of introduction, really, I just thought it'd be useful to start with a typical example from a, a textbook. So <clears throat> um, this is a page from an English textbook uh, aimed at school leaving certificates. Uh, so that's 14 to 16 year olds. And, and we can see here the whole kind of typical structure of a textbook. There's a, a photographic source it's designed to be used as evidence by the children. And there's a narrative introduced by the author. So here's the narrative up close. We can have a think about what they're saying. So just have a read through of this text. So you might want to pause the video and just give yourself a moment to read through and familiarize yourself with it. And then I'm just going to say a few comments about how this text is constructed. So the first thing to note is um, how these key ideas are introduced. So a key part of the narrative that is driving this piece of text is this idea that from this point onwards, from 1906 onwards, the state would look after those people who are too poor to help themselves. And that that's expensive. Because it's expensive, taxes need to be raised. It's the rich people who will pay the taxes and many rich people objected to the idea that they would have to pay for the government reforms. They claimed that helping poor people would just encourage them to be lazy and make them less likely to help themselves. So instantly we, we have an introduction to this notion of the establishment of the welfare state in Britain, which talks about two groups, the poor and the rich, and, at, and in the way that it describes them, the way that it introduces them, it um, creates this sense that the two would be opposed to one another, their interests would be divergent. And then it frames the question for the rest of the chapter in these terms, why was it that attitudes became more sympathetic towards the poor? Why was it that the, the rich uh, gave up their opposition to high, higher taxes in order to pay the poor? So the whole notion of the welfare state is, is set up in a particular way. Now, that's fair enough in one sense. These are um, historically accurate um, facts and there is an interpretation being laid on here, but it's one that will be shared by many people. So it's useful just to think though, as, as we are driven through this relatively unproblematic argument, how are the people referred to and how are these ideas set up? Because really this question only makes sense because it arises from the argument that's already been established in the preceding couple of paragraphs. But it's useful to think about alternatives. So here's um, an article written for the BBC History website by uh, a Labour Member of Parliament, Frank Field. He makes the observation that histories of the welfare state usually begin around 1945. <clears throat> that marks a high point in the history of welfare in Britain. But, he says, um, beginning the story there, distorts the record. It promotes the idea of welfare development as being part of a collective train journey um, where we are safely steered towards a collective welfare state terminal. And one of Frank Field's political positions um, in the contemporary debate about the role of the state is that there is an earlier tradition of welfare, which is about local communities and local self-help organisations. And he feels that the history of um, the welfare state has been um, uh, has really been dominated by the story about the growing role of government, rather than the different functions of that welfare performs and the different processes you can employ to achieve the outcome of collective welfare. So he goes back earlier and says the theme of most welfare histories is this coming of the welfare state with the emphasis on the state as though all previous forms of welfare were temporary or incomplete and that it was inevitable that Britain's welfare should be ultimately dominated by the state. And therefore once the state intervention was established that was the end of history. However if we go back further he says 
and take that as the vantage point, we would have a very different perspective. In the 19th century, Britain's welfare was characterised by voluntary provision with mutual and friendly societies delivering a whole range of benefits. <clears throat> Local authorities and voluntary run hospitals, together with a national system of doctors, were financed from health insurance contributions, which were set by the state but collected through mutually owned societies. So, what um, Frank Field is pointing out is that there, there tends to be, and I think the history textbook we started with reflects this, there tends to be a dominant narrative about the centrality of the state in organising welfare centrally and everything up until the establishment of that form of welfare provision is seen as imperfect steps towards what was inevitably going to happen. But he argues there's a different way to construct um, the historical account of this by analysing these alternative methods to provide welfare then we can open up the debate. If you, if you start with a historical trajectory which leads you to a point, it's very difficult to use your historical knowledge to think about a point beyond that. Everything appears to be inevitable. Whereas if you start by thinking about alternative ways to organise things at different points and examine the logic of those, then a, a thorough understanding of the history of welfare means that you can apply that to think about creative and new solutions to welfare problems today. So just by opening up with two very short examples of contrasting accounts of history, hopefully I'm illustrating for you some of the reasons why textbook construction has been seen as particularly problematic um, within academia. So what do textbooks do when they provide these kinds of accounts? Well, here's a, a quote from Schrag. He says, history textbooks are bad not because they're biased, but because their biases are concealed by the tone. History texts are generally written as if their authors didn't exist at all. The tone of the textbook is the tone of a dis disembodied voice speaking in passive sentences. It fosters the widespread confusion that the text is history, not simply a human construct composed of selected data, interpretations and opinions. So if we just flick back to think about this text from the textbook, look at the way the language is constructed. From now on, the state would look after those too poor to help themselves, but to do so, this would be expensive. Taxes had to be raised so that money could be spent on giving the poor the help they needed. All of these ideas are connected, but they are presented as though that were the only viable way that you could read these facts together. There's an alternative history, as Frank um, Fields indicates, there are other histories about the rise of the working class, making increased demands against the state, uh, helping to achieve social collective rights. That's an alternative um, interpretation. There are different ways in which you can piece together this story. But what happens in textbooks is that the author presents the information as though it were one incontrovertible, unarguable account, as though this were the truth. And this has led Porat to say that history textbooks narrate history for students, and in doing so they suppress alternative narratives. Textbook Textbooks present students with a supposed factual account, and in some instances the authors conceal, in others they select, but in all they interpret and they uh, present their interpretations as though that were the historical fact. Now if we contrast this with the way that academic historians write, we can see the different voice emerging, the different style of writing. Here's an extract that I've just chosen at random really, because it's a, it's a book that I'm currently reading. Um, David Canadine's book, The Undivided Past. This is from his introductory comments in the first chapter. He says, It's been rightly observed that one of the prime justifications for studying and writing history is to free ourselves from the tyranny of present-day opinion, and these pages, in other words, the book he's writing, seek to contribute to that liberating endeavour by questioning the conventional wisdom of single identity politics and the scholarly preoccupations with difference. So at the outset, he positions his book as a contribution to the broader debate about identity. He says that um, there is this preoccupation with difference, that people tend to focus on single identity politics, but I am contributing a history book which tries to do something different. And in doing that, he says, there is a broader tradition of history writing which attempts to give people a new perspective on understanding what's going on around them. So he positions his argument within a broader sense of what he thinks history is for and he says that he's standing against the the major trend in contemporary writing about identity. But then he goes on 
Um, even more interestingly, I think, to talk about the difficulty of writing a small book on a huge topic. So he says another difficulty with this book is the scale and scope of the enterprise. Of each of these chapters, it's reasonable to say that a lifetime's reading and research is insufficient to acquire even a halfway competent understanding of the subject matter. To this charge, I can but reply, the attempt is the attempt to open up the subject, if only to encourage or provoke others to do it better, is worth incurring the accusation of overreach. So here he's also saying that he recognises he's writing across a, a broad variety of topics, all aspects of how people construct their identity. In doing that, he's spreading his efforts fairly thin. He recognises that he'll be writing in areas where other people have greater expertise. But he, he, So he's saying at the outset, this is an imperfect attempt to provide an overview. Other people will know more than me about each of the issues I write about, but what he's trying to do is make some connections and be thought-provoking. So f from the very first few pages, he's saying this is not a definitive account. This is not true. This is an imperfect contribution with the best effort that I could bring to it in the time I had. Other people will correct me. There will be mistakes, but I'm hoping this will provide the way forward for us to have a, a collective conversation where we avoid falling into some of the simplistic traps about thinking uh, around um, how people construct their identity. So it's a much more tentative um, and a much less sure-footed way of constructing a text than the author of the school textbook tends to, um, tends to adopt. So what changes as we move from this kind of provisional historical account towards the school textbook? Well, sorry, when, when presented in history, scholarly book authors are expected to frame their contribution as, as arguments and as contributions to the debate. They situate themselves in an ongoing debate and they note where they change their minds, how they have constructed their interpretation and where they've got something novel to add. So it's almost like history books written by historians are contributions to an ongoing discussion. By contrast, textbooks tend to hide that. They tend to present a single authoritative account, they tend to cover up debates and arguments, and they present as a consequence not just a single narrative, but actually a fairly dried out version of history which avoids the interesting academic enterprise of constructing history, and it presents the story as though that were a true historical account, as though the story and history were one and the same thing. Um, it, and in the process that takes away a huge intellectual challenge and it asserts an authority that most historians would not assert over their topic. Now what's interesting about thinking about textbooks and how they're used in the history classroom, as Nichols points out in his comparative research, he looked at um, World War II across five countries, how World War II was treated in textbooks in five countries that is, and he points out the following, that um, there is a great variety in the extent to which textbooks are centrally controlled by governments and therefore in the extent to which teachers have a choice over what, which textbooks to use. In some countries, government issues a single textbook and expect everyone to teach from it. Um, and in those places, the textbook is essentially the history course and the teacher is just delivering the history course as mediated by the textbook. But in other countries where teachers have relatively free choice, they're just using um, textbooks as one source of information among many. So for example, in England, there's a relatively free market in textbooks. They're produced by companies. They're not sponsored by government. Teachers can choose to use one or many textbooks. And they tend, therefore, to be written full of sources of information so teachers can use them as a kind of compendium of information rather than always presenting a single authoritative narrative. <clears throat> now Nichols says it's not all plain sailing because in some of those textbooks he says that the authors have gone to such lengths to put in um, different opinions, different perspectives and different interpretations of the key events around the Second World War that uh, it actually runs the risk that children just get bogged down and overwhelmed by the fact that there are so many different opinions on the same topic and therefore um, that it runs the risk that they can be left with the impression that um, anyone can think anything about history. So that kind of um, approach to writing textbooks which is uh, pluralistic, which reflects a plurality of voices and perspectives, presents a different teaching challenge to the kind of challenge thrown up where you just have one government-sponsored textbook that is endorsed and 
indeed is required to be used as the dominant source of information. Those textbooks, Nichols says, also tend to have more of an authoritative narrative, so they tend to be driven less by the provision of lots of sources of information and driven much more by the government endorsed um, take of what the historical story should be. So these are some of the references I've drawn on for this part. Hopefully I've just given you some context in which to think about textbooks comparatively and um, problematically really as, as artifacts that have been constructed for particular purposes and are used in a network of different kind of relationships and teacher expectations. In the second part I'm going to go on and say something a bit more practical really about what, what teachers do with textbooks and how we can use them in those different contexts and for different purposes.